On this week's video, we are trying something new, yet oddly familiar. Uh, if you were watching my channel back in April, you know I did an experiment called How Bad Could It Be, where I watched movies that I thought were going to end up being really, really terrible, and watched them to find out if they were as bad as I thought they were going to be, or if they were actually pleasantly surprising, which quite a few of them were. And I figured it was time to actually give this its own series, so welcome to the first official episode of How Bad Can It Be, and we're going to kick it off in a grandiose style, with the Witchcraft series. Yeah, this is 16 movies of actually a consistent continuity going through every single one of them. I guess we're going to see if it makes any sense, because even though this is how bad can it be, it's still going to be a timeline. Because you're about to find out why, because this timeline is really goofy. This whole thing kicks off back in 1988 with Witchcraft, as Grace here has a baby. This is her husband and his 80s hair and suit, and he suggests that they move into his mother's house to help with the baby. You know that it's going to be trouble when it's the same house as the one from the people under the stairs, and Grace starts having these weird visions. A priest sees flames around little William, so clearly things are not exactly on the up and up, and the baby may actually just belong to Rosemary. His face turns to mush and he kills himself, probably because he heard that there's like 15 more of these movies. Grace's visions intensify as her husband and mother-in-law act creepier and creepier while everything has the basic aesthetic of a meatloaf music video, and eventually Grace's friend is murdered, with like 10 minutes of the movie left to go. I like how they show just enough of her head to realize that yes, it's a, man it's a mannequin head. It's finally revealed to the surprise of literally no one that her husband and mother-in-law are evil and out to get her baby. There are also witches, the same ones that Grace had seen in her visions, and they try to sacrifice her, but she's saved by the butler. He gets pulled, so Grace has to take out Mommy herself, and she holds little William. Contrary to what you might think about this one, there's no nudity here, and the only moment of sex happens off-screen. And there's no date, so I guess real-time 88? That's gonna change. So one year later, a sequel happened with Witchcraft 2, The Temptress. And we meet Will here, whose girlfriend doesn't want to have sex. So I guess he... Uh, air guitars. That's a perfectly natural reaction. We then see that there's an evil force that has some sort of influence on Will, and they say that he's about to go to college, so he'd be about 18 here, even though that the actor was almost 30 at the time of shooting. Will has this neighbor that fixes her house in this outfit, and it's okay with him just, just grabbing at her ass. And his mom stabs her in this thrilling scene. His mom dies and Dolores takes her form and kills a classmate, and more has happened in a half hour of this film than in the entirety of the first one. His dad has a heart to heart with him. I mean that we took you away from the people that were raising you. Why? And here's the bombshell that this is baby Will from the first film and that we jumped ahead 18 years. So, theoretically, that places this one in 2006. Unless this is real-time 89, and the first movie is supposed to be 1971, although the clothes and cars and such seem to contradict that. We're told that Grace committed suicide, so his adoptive parents stole him, and his dad is the next to go. They decide to fight Dolores, and this priest says that he has a rite of exorcism from Father Marin, so I guess that we're in the same universe as the Exorcist. Things get crazy with these super convincing fire effects, and I'll say one thing for Dolores, she knows how to make an entrance. Here I go again on my own. If you want me to convince you that you should watch these movies, or even just this one, just know that it's about 50% for boobs, and the other 50% are Will's reactions to things. Although I think that the reactions are probably like 60%. Dolores lays out her master plan to have Will impregnate her with a child of hell, but he stabs her with his crucifix. 
I'm sorry, I, I blame the movies. This defeats the evil, and again, no visible date, but in order to make this make a little bit of sense, I think I'd rather place this in real time and fudge the date back to the first one of 1971, even though that one clearly takes place in the 80s, but really all that's important is that there's 18 years between them. And now, his son will fuck me, and our child will rule the world. A short two years later, we see the next entry with 1991's Witchcraft 3, The Kiss of Death, and Will's back and, and, and great. Just great. He's, he's now a lawyer. That means that he's gone to college and law school, so giving a four-year degree and three years of law school, this is minimally seven years later. So I guess this one is set in 1996? Just to recap, they're saying that it's at least a 25 year gap between the first film and this one and they came out three years apart. He's defending a young man wrongly accused of murder and then there's this new evil warlock in town and at one point Will basically kidnaps a colleague and the warlock kills her. After exonerating the young man, Will teams up with his father who is in no way just a blatant caricature of a stereotype to take down the bad guy. Evil Lewis then seduces Will's girlfriend as the series shifts even more towards blatant softcore porn with several prolonged sex scenes, and the two finally square off with Will basically just wrestling him into submission. I think he's supposed to be using his warlock abilities here, but look at this. This is just two grown men crawling around on the ground like this is a David Decato film. Finally, Will defeats him by choking him with his staff. Sorry, I, I still still blame the movies. He returns to life and is killed by a shovel, and Will and Charlotte are reunited. Another year passed, and in 1992 we get Witchcraft 4, The Virgin Heart, which begins with a young woman who tries to call 911, and I guess manages to dial the wrong number? And then she's killed by a mysterious man. We then get our first sort of date confirmation of the entire series as this license plate has a sticker that expires in 1992, so we're in real time, which means that everything that we've seen so far is off. Will is back and he has a noir environment and narration now that says that it's been three years since he last used his powers, so it's three years since the last film, so that one had to be in 1989 then. Which would make part two set in 1982, which is justifiable, but then the first film would be set in 1964? Sure, uh, it, it doesn't make any sense, but we're just gonna go with it because these are, because these are witchcraft movies. Will isn't a public defender anymore and has a private practice now, and... Now Lily, I've talked to Pete, and he's pretty reluctant to say anything. How is he? I mean, okay, considering he's in jail. What? They find a cliche clue for a club called Coven, and Penthouse Pet of the Year Julie Strain is here as Belladonna, a stripper, and Will acts more like a private detective than a lawyer, I guess to fit the whole noir analogy that they're going with here. BD has a super jealous guy obsessed with her and his muscle. Well, Jesus fucking Christ, let me clip you, man. I hate that fucking tall ass Texan, drawl talking, corn eating, fucking Nelson looking, cow humping motherfucker, man. And that leads us to my all time favorite abrupt cut. Why did, why did you end up raising him by yourself? My parents were murdered. I guess, I guess so much for that conversation. But then there's this guy. You know, okay, you got it, that's it, I'm done. I'm late for my heart class. Goodbye. I want a whole movie with just that guy. For, forget Will. Turns out that the manager made a deal with the devil for the power of the blues, and I guess has a deal with Bella, and he finally fights him, and I guess drains him of his magic. Everything wraps up tight, and I guess BD gets a recording contract, and oddly enough, this film is the directorial debut of James Marandino, who gave us the marvelous SLC Punk just six years later, and early in the film, you can hear someone on the radio talking about a new hit film called Cat in a Box. So, today's news, the Lakers are talking about the latest new movie, Cat in a Box. And apparently, as I'm writing this, IMDB has James in pre-production on a horror film called Cat in a Box. So that news report was only off about 30 years. 
One more year goes by, and in 1993 comes Witchcraft 5, Dance with the Devil, which spends a lot of time in the beginning setting up a reverend who is taken over by evil, or, you know, a scratch on the film, I'm not sure which, and a new bad guy in Discount Vigo. Then, 18 minutes into the movie, Will finally appears, and he's been recast and has a new girlfriend. Our villain, Walmart Dio, is named Kane, and he's a magician, and is fantastically over the top. This little demonstration of my power over you, Warlock, was amusing. But the next time, no one will laugh. <sighs> Soft dress with hundreds of souls. If we find him, all our preparations will be complete, and the reign of Satan will be near! You! True soldiers of Satan. He has an assistant who is supposed to be a different character than Will's girlfriend Kelly, although someone probably should have told the casting director. Kane enchants Will and uses him to help collect souls of people that made deals with him, so a new witch comes on board named Astasia to help out. Well, she dies, and then this one shifts tones, and this is the first one of these things to really be what I thought this whole series was. The earlier films had nudity, sure, but this one has several extended sex scenes that go on for quite a while as the series finally embraces becoming Skinamax fair. When Kane tries to sacrifice Kelly, Will shakes off the enchantment and fights back, cutting off his head. Now there's no date again and no mention of a time frame, but he had time to meet Kelly and their relationship advanced enough to them talking about getting married, so let's say one year and this is still real time 93. Another year, another movie, as 94 gives us the appropriately titled Witchcraft 666, The Devil's Mistress, which kicks off by telling us that there's a killer on the loose and an eclipse is about to occur. They say it's the first in 66 years, and the last one was 1928, so that puts us in real time 94, and one year has passed since the last film, although this card's registration stickers expire in October of 93, so he should probably get that taken care of. We meet officers Lutz and Garner, police detectives after the killer, and there's a whole bunch of setup until 21 minutes in when Will finally arrives in his most discount McConaughey look yet as he's been recast yet again. He's still with Kelly, although she's also been recast, unless he's with a new girl with the same name, and there's actually a pretty amusing sequence where they bring in a bunch of psychics to help out and give them a decoy bra to weed out the crackpots. Our villain warlock here is called Sabatini, and he likes eggs, looking like a deep discount Julian Sands, and acting like a bargain special Louis Cipher. Will has a client with a white dress and no underwear, so he follows his most basic instinct and investigates, because I'm not sure that they know the difference between what a divorced lawyer and a private investigator is. Sabatini eventually kidnaps Will's secretary and plans to sacrifice her, but Will stabs the sidekick and makes Savvy the victim of his own spell. For a guy who I think is supposed to be the Master Warlock, he sure doesn't really use magic. He just kind of wrestles around with people a while and then stabs them with stuff. He and Lutz then go off to get donuts. It should come as no surprise when I say that another film came one year later, so 1995 sees Witchcraft 7, Judgment Hour, which was described on the video box cover as the final chapter. I'm wishing that, but I know that we're not even half done here. This one starts with vampires, so we're branching out from the plot of, oh, you know, all of the previous entries with evil warlocks that want to perform a ritual and are stopped at the last minute by Will Raslin. There's also milk! for some reason. Speaking of Will, he's been recast yet again and he's lost his drawl and looks quite a bit older. If this is still in real time and this is 1995 and we're rolling with him being born in 1964, that would make him 31 years old here and the actor was 43 at the time of shooting. Lutz and Garner are back, but Garner has been de-aged and got his hair back and Lutz, well, Lutz is now a woman. I, th I think it's supposed to be the same character, but I guess to fit continuity, it's just another cop with the same last name. There's all these shots with the camera like three inches from everyone's faces, and Kelly's here again, but she's been recast again also. Will goes to visit his mother's graves and gives, um, you know, an, an interesting performance. 
I don't even know what that was. The bad guy is a vampire named Hasa, and just to show you this series' commitment to sleaze, Will is representing a couple whose kid is put in the hospital by a drunk driver, and when he calls them, like, two days later, the movie is sure to show you the couple having sex when he calls. Nothing makes me hornier than when my kid is in the hospital! The vampires can become bats, as evidenced by this puppet here, and Kelly gets turned. And when Will goes in to stop the vampire group, Lutz and Garner just kind of stay outside and I guess, you know, wait. The bad guys are super clever though. The police aren't stupid! We were never gonna get away with killing all those women! Quiet, you little insect! <laughs> you just, just gonna blurt that out? Will fights a puppet and he stakes Hasa, but is stabbed as well, killing him. Kelly is actually the one to deliver the killing blow and that's it for Will, I suppose. That whole final chapter thing only lasted one year since 1996 gave us Witchcraft 8 Salem's Ghost, which took things in a different direction. It starts in 1692 as a warlock is burned alive, and then jumps to 300 years later, so I guess this is set in 1992? A couple move into a big old house, moving is the greatest hair. And in case you thought a new direction means less softcore sex scenes, as soon as Sonny here worries that he might be having a mental breakdown, his wife suggests her own form of therapy, which is sex with all the food items in the fridge. Sonny's a professor, and he had an affair with a student, and they have wacky neighbors. And Mitch here accidentally frees the warlock trapped beneath the house. Meanwhile, Sonny's apparently just so attractive that his students just can't help but fall in love with him. And soon, ominous things start to happen around the house as the warlock starts to get free and starts to move the furniture around. I mean, with the help of this hand right here. A priest arrives sporting the worst fake Irish accent of all time. I'm afraid something terrible has occurred here, Mr. Dunaway. Something of great magnitude with incomprehensible ramifications, not only for you and for this house, but for the entire world of Christianity and recruits Sonny to hunt witches. They call up the lead singer of Bush and then just kind of whip him with this cat toy until he stands on the roof like a really crappy crow. Mitch goes mad and the priest is killed by a spike falling from a building top because, you know, omen. In the thrilling showdown, Sonny just kind of stabs him with the giant cross thing that's the warlock's weakness even though he was holding it. The warlock saw him holding it and did absolutely nothing when he moved to swing it, it's like, it's like the worst villain of all time. Things chugged along and the franchise kept the churn in and 1997 unleashed Witchcraft 9, Bitter Flesh, with the return of the director of Part 7. The opening features the cheapest spirit effect in all of film history as Will Spanner returns. Apparently there was a huge uproar over his character's death and all of the Will fans united to demand his return. All three of them. Kelly is back, once again recast, and if this picks up right after the last one, why isn't she more concerned about the whole vampire thing that would have just happened last night? Oh, and that would make this still 1995. No one can see or hear Will, and he tests this out by, um, putting his hand in a prostitute's crotch. Lutz and Garner are back, and they've been recast again, looking nothing like either of their previous incarnations. We're then introduced to a prostitute character and have to just follow her around for like 20 minutes without even knowing who she is or what relevance she has to the story. Story. Will keeps testing his limits, like I think he's supposed to be putting his hand through them here instead of just waving his hand around them. Finally, the hooker's purpose is revealed as she can hear Will's ghost because she was in a motorcycle accident and now has powers. Lutz's outfit has switched to look less cop and more stripper now, and I love that this is one day after the events of Part 7 and they don't even mention Will or vampires or anything at all. Garland says that it's Los Angeles in 1996, which changes our date and also that of Part 7? 
and some evil force has stolen Will's body and the big bad killer ends up being Sheila's pimp whose weird acting is the only bright spot in this one. He gets burned up and Will is restored to his own body. Another year, another witchcraft, as 1998 gets Witchcraft 10, Mistress of the Craft. And we're in London now, and there's vampires again. There's also this killer here named Hyde, and for some reason they've called in Lutz to come extradite him, because that's, that's how that works, you just call in some random LA homicide detective to do it. And Lutz is actually the only returning character this time, there's no Will, or Kelly, or even Garner. Unfortunately, the vampire girls show up to free him, and they want to give him power during Walpurgis. There's also this Interpol agent named Celeste, who happens to be pretty good at vamp killing, and occasionally wears a cape and sort of, like, superhero costume? She's some sort of good witch fighting against an evil force while the vampires stalk people like this? Who, who walks like this? All of the vampires do this weird walk and constantly hiss at people. Oh, God. Oh. Why do vampires always walk around in movies with their mouth wide open hissing at people? It just seems really unsanitary. There's one of the dumbest fight scenes of all time. And just look at these three. Th these three are all cops. These are outfits that the filmmaker thought that female police officers would wear. Celeste makes magic light crosses, and here's a tip, movie. Don't have people face off in martial arts poses if no one actually knows any martial arts. You know, this is the first one of these that actually fully crosses into how bad can it be territory. Most of the ones before this were you know, fairly watchable, like cheap and bad, but, but watchable. This is the first one that actually delves into the full terrible territory where it just feels as if the filmmakers have no clue what they're doing uh, in any way, shape, or form. I, I think by the time that I was like watching the sixth or the seventh one, I was actually questioning whether or not that this belongs in this series um but you know starting with the last one and definitely with this one it's fully crossed that line so they finally defeat hyde really really easily and with no on-screen date we're rolling with real time here and it's 1998 and two years have passed since the last film there was actually a two-year gap and we didn't get a new entry until 2000 with witchcraft 11 sisters in blood and i have a bad feeling things aren't going to get any better here and there's still six more to go will and kelly are back both completely new people and will looks nothing like his former selves they get an invitation that has this blackberry stamp on it and i i actually researched this damn stamp and it's from 1999 so that's our date here so Will is 35, and actually so was the actor, so for once this casting makes sense. Kelly's sister is in the Scottish play, and her director and co-star are actually Satanists. They have a ritual to raise some ancient witches, and one takes over Marie here. And Lutz and Garner are back, actually the same actors here. They're investigating occult stuff and run into Will and Kelly, who says that they're engaged now, and it's about time. They've been together for like six years now. Will finally tells her that he has supernatural abilities, which I guess she didn't figure out from any of their previous predicaments. The witch girls kill the professor in a series rare gore bit and allows Abaddon to take over his body. And Kelly's haircut, I, I just can't get past it. Why do I think that this is going to end with Kelly asking to talk to Abaddon's manager? Lutz still wears non-regulation uniforms on the job and Colleen also ends up witch possessed. They all face off in the woods and Lutz and Garner are tricked into having sex. I guess it's complicated. Satan is called up. I mean, I think that's what this is supposed to be. And Will saves the day, so the witches tear Abaddon apart. Colleen is restored, and this one is actually a step up from the last one. It at least feels like a real movie, just a really cheap one, instead of whatever garbage was right before this. Another two years pass, taking us to 2002's Witchcraft 12 in the Lair of the Serpent, which kicks off with a man being murdered by a person in a mask with red eyes. 
Will has been recast yet again, looking completely different. Kelly is gone, and Will goes to visit an old friend. Her brother was the guy in the beginning, and there's more killings involving lightning eyes, and then Will and Cindy have sex. Nothing puts me in the mood more than having a relative die just a few days ago. They find the girl who lured Jeff away in the beginning and chase her, and the cop just straight up shoots her. The trouble seems to be originating at a strip club, of course, causing Will to come face to face with Mask Guy, and they have a cartoon lightning battle. The cop shows up again, and once again immediately starts shooting, but he's killed, and then there's the inevitable final ritual where the hooded man reveals himself to be Malleus, who's a lizard man? Will magics himself free and then uses Lightning Bolt. Lightning Bolt. He saves the day and I guess stays with Cindy. There's no date in this one, so we're giving it real time 02, three years after the last one. There was actually a six year gap until the next entry, 2008's Witchcraft 13 Blood of the Chosen, which starts with a man getting his heart torn out, and oh my god, is that Windows Media Player? Will has been recast again, still a lawyer, and he meets up with a friend who also has powers. And Will mentions that Kelly left because of his witchcraft. And judging from the license plates and posters, he's moved from LA to Texas. When his friend is killed, he talks to the police and one says he knows Lutz. Will asks if it's Lucy or her brother, I guess confirming that the character's gender switch after part 6 wasn't a switch, but two characters that were siblings. Will says he hasn't talked to them in years, so we're quite away from the last time that they talked in Part 11. He meets up with Discount Jenna Elfman, and then remember when Will had a marking behind his ear? Well, now he has a massive 666 on the back of his neck that we've just never noticed until now. This would be really hard to hide. Like, if Will wore a t-shirt, like, once, like, everybody would see it. They face off in super high-tech 08 graphics, and a woman named Dolores comes to his office, and Will says that he knew a Dolores a few years ago in a rare bit of series continuity, referring to the second film. Of course, there's, there's a ritual. It's always a ritual. And Will shows up to fight, but Dolores is revealed to be evil, as if you didn't see that coming. But she, I guess, ends up being related to Will. She, she keeps calling him brother, but at most she'd have to be a cousin or something. They do magics back and forth, and Will goes kinda evil to save the day, and maybe finally succumbs to Satan's call. So anyway, no date here, but real time seems fair, giving Will time to move to Texas and get settled in with a new law firm and such. Okay, we're in a home stretch here as we bounce ahead another 8 years to 2016 with Witchcraft 14 Angel of Death, bringing the series back after a huge gap by an immense outcry of demand. This was directed by How Bad Can It Be alum David Palmieri, who also directed Captain Battle in my bootleg MCU timeline, so I don't have high hopes. We get a date right away with this messenger app telling us that we're set in October of 2015, so we're seven years away from the last film now, and Rose here is a witch, of course. Lutz and Garner are back, although they are recast also, making this our third Lutz and fourth Garner. Rose can basically wish people dead, and... Then there's this yoga studio that's actually a coven. But then Will shows up, again recast, with no mention of his evil turn at the ending of the last one, making Ryan Cleary the ninth actor to play the role, counting baby Will from the first film. Plus, keep in mind, the character should be 49 years old at this point, but I'm guessing in the past seven years he moved back to LA. Well, I guess if I could sit through all these movies where 30-year-olds can play teens, I can manage a guy in his 20s playing almost 50. He also wears a t-shirt, and you can see the back of his neck, and the 666 is definitely gone, so I guess it was just for that movie. His friend is killed, and he gives this astounding reaction. What? No! This can't be. She was fine. Healthy? No. This must have been some kind of mistake. Let me see. Let me, let me look this up. Best Actor in 2016. Leonardo in The Revenant? Did the Academy just totally miss this movie? Of course there's a ritual and Samuel here is apparently the Angel of Death trapped on Earth, so he's trying to reclaim his true form. 
lets and garner storm in and starts shooting at people that are literally just standing around and and then there's the standard low rent magic battle but after they kill her mom rose takes out sammy but it ends with the promise the threat maybe that it has begun so parts 14, 15, and 16 were filmed back to back and released at the same time. So also in 2016, we get Witchcraft 15, Blood Rose, which bounces ahead one month later. So we're still in 2015, sometime in November. Rose is still with the Coven, who are supposedly good now, but they keep acting evil. Rose has a flashback to her own conception, and they use footage of Will and the little elf girl from part 13 for some reason, but I think it's not supposed to be them. Let's and Garner are back, as is Will, and since these were filmed at the same time, they're all the same actors, and there's just something completely non-threatening about the concept of a coven of yoga witches. Evil Sharon plans to use this guy to bring Samuel back to life, and she succeeds, but he kills her. Rose and Will team up to beat him, and after a quick showdown with a body-switched Sharon, and another completely unnecessary softcore scene, it's over. Okay, here we go. Last one. Released at the same time as parts 14 and 15 in 2016, we end with Witchcraft 16, Hollywood Coven. Again, we pick up right where we left off, but it's all a movie. They say it's for Crystal Force 15 Blood Rose, and then it's a snuff film, apparently. The Crystal Force movies, which I guess have been the Witchcraft movies, have only been successful because the directors had deals with Satan? and they're all part of a coven back to make Crystal Force 16. All the actors from the last two are back and they note that most of the actors from the previous films didn't do anything afterwards, insinuating that they were killed, which is I guess why the parts constantly got recast. The car's registration sticker is for 2015, so you know we're most likely set in a real time of this alternate universe. The weird thing is that the characters that they're playing are different, like Will Spanner's character is actually called Greg Andrews, so although it's a separate film universe, the movies they're talking about are not the actual movies that we were watching, just films that played out similarly. In this universe, part 10 was called Headmistress of Magic, and 11 was called The New Class, and it was unfairly overlooked for an Oscar nomination, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> this, this guy is just the worst. And then this is weird. So last year, this table here was sitting outside the front of our building to be picked up as trash, and Christy saw it and liked it and brought it inside, and we cleaned it up and fixed it, and, and it's our table now. Witchcraft 16 was actually filmed somewhere near where we lived, and, and look at this. I think you give them things, they don't they just say they're going to watch it. Well, I'll know when they're watching that. All right, they better watch it. they got to take care of something. They don't know who you are. Then you're, you're an extraordinaire. Come on. Do we, do we have the witchcraft table? Is this really happening? They sit around and watch part 11 mainly, so I guess that they can just show clips and pad the runtime. And Sharon, whose name was Sharon in the previous two movies and her real life analog is also called Sharon, I, I guess, kills Sam. She's told that the movies are hexed to find other witches and warlocks and they need to bring new people into the coven. This is gonna be good. No, it's kind of not. It's definitely kind of not. Actor Spanner is killed and actress Rose joins up and actor Garner discovers that actress Lutz is the head of the coven and they intend to make an army of witches to take over Hollywood. The witches all fight and after waving their hands at each other for a while, Lutz and Patrick team up to continue making Crystal Force movies. So there you have it, 16 witchcraft movies. And uh, continuity-wise, they try to make sense, but they don't do the best job with it. That's a really weird timeline. But more importantly, how bad can they be? Well, the answer is not that bad, and then absolutely bad. Um, for the most part, this was 16 movies that I was really dreading, but ended up not really feeling that bad about. Uh, most of the early ones are kind of dull, not that interesting, but they're not boring uh and they were watchable i had an okay time watching them they it wasn't until we got to about like nine or ten or whatever that it just started to get really really bad and all the way up until 16 it just felt really hard to get through 
So if you are going to watch any of these, maybe watch a couple of the early ones, I guess. Um, they are bad in a funny way, um, so they're entertaining. But I, I, I wouldn't watch too many. If you've, if you've seen one or two, you've pretty much seen all of them. Well, let me know what you thought of this down below. If you've seen the witchcraft movies and you have any special feelings towards them, tell me all about it because i, I got to hear about these special feelings. Um, if you've actually seen all of them, please let me know that you're in the same club. I feel like watching all the, the witchcraft movies puts you in some sort of special club. Um, but, you know, so tell me about that. Like, subscribe, check out the patrons over here. These guys went to patreon.com and they have helped support the channel. You can do that as well too by going there and uh, helping support the channel. But thank you for watching these videos because that also helps the channel. And I'll see you very shortly for another great video. Thanks guys.